everybody knows me, and I'm kind of a little bit hesitant because the plan was to start talking so the students can understand, but I think it's never a bad idea to start talking so the students will understand. And the talk will be not about something I'm doing. The talk is about something that Papa Dimitro, the name is familiar to many of you because he's the author of many textbooks and the big authority in complex complexity is doing now. And it's very interesting because it relates to this notion of NP hardness. NP hardness is something that kind of people are familiar with. Many people outside computer science have no idea what that means, are very familiar with that. And recently there was a very embarrassing situation. I don't know if you've looked at your communications of ACM yet. In the, there's letters to the editor. And one of the letters is about some uh, researcher who wrote a paper, and this she mentioned somewhere in brief that some problem is NP hard, which means it cannot be solved in polynomial time. And then somebody corrected that, well, you should be saying that it's only if P is not equal to NP and so on. And this guy, without thinking too much, replies, he's clearly not a specialist right, in theory, right. that NP actually stands for not solvable in polynomial time. Oh, no. <laughs> right there on the communications of ACM. So I cannot assume that even professors in this department, hopefully everybody knows that. But it's kind of, it's difficult to say. It's like I recently quote Dr. Ward because I was talking with uh, my colleague Kung Guyan from NMSU. And he went to this mood where all faculty one at a time go, how bad the students have done on the test. And he said, they don't even know what a latent variable is. And I was so, kind of shocked by the force of his confession that I was afraid to confess that I don't know that either. Lord <laughs> 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 Nigel on the hallway, he was running to the class, I looked on the Wikipedia, now I know what it is. But that's one of those things. So, uh, this is the no, what I'm saying is that how, where does all this start? So I'll just brief overview. Uh, need to distinguish easy problem from difficult ones. Then there will be the traditional approach, which I will very briefly manage. There will be no proofs. Well, too late to unscare people who didn't come, but <laughs> at least so that you are here, you won't be scared. Traditional approach, which is NP completeness. Then new problems that are not covered, and the new idea of Papadimitro. Okay, so, and the new idea will be new problems, they are about Nash equilibrium, for those who may be familiar with it a little bit. Uh, and the thing that I try to look up on the Wikipedia or the Twitter is, so, every time you get a haircut, no matter how you comb your hair, there is a point where the hair goes in different directions. How do you call it in English? It's the, um, the cowlick? Yeah. yeah. What? Cowlick. Oh, cowlick. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. that's okay. where the cowlick might occur. Cowlick, literally. Okay, okay. so it's not cowlick, like two words. Okay. But it doesn't necessarily have to Okay. So there is a theorem that cowlicks always exist, and computing this cowlick, it turns out, is one of those problems that are difficult to compute according to this new definition of probability. So first, why do we need to distinguish easy problems from the difficult ones? <laughs> well, uh, let me put it this way. There are theoreticians who love to develop algorithms. And I hope I'm not one of them, but maybe sometimes I act like a one. And then they would like to give it to a student or to somebody else to implement. And say, this should be not that difficult to implement. <laughs> and that something runs for a long time, and then once it runs for a long time, the student comes to you and says, oh, it already ran for several hours and it didn't stop. You must be doing something wrong. My algorithm works well. <laughs> so, well, we know very well that some algorithms that we develop run fast and some run a long time. And it's not like wrong time that can be resolved by fact of life. Fact of life. Something that I will be telling students in CS2 on Tuesday. Some algorithms are feasible And some are, I would say, theoretical. <laughs> theoretical, not in the good sense of this word, but in the bad sense of this word. In the sense that you run them and they take forever. So the normal definition is what? 
if something runs n square, n cube, logarithm time, then it's good. If something runs exponential time, that's bad. Why is it bad? Because what does it mean exponential time? Like many exhaustive search algorithms. It means that if n is about 300 or 400, then I don't want to waste your time, but you need more computation steps than the whole lifetime of the universe. So, well, it depends on whether you believe in cosmology or God's creation, but in both cases it's logic. <laughs> so in cosmology it's also true. Okay, so, and parallelism doesn't help because it's not just in the universe, it's every, if every particle independently is doing some computation, it's very hard, <laughs> and they're all working in parallel, you can still can't finish by 20 billion years, whatever it is the universe is about. And that would have been the end of the talk, that would be a very nice distinction if it was possible. Unfortunately, for many problems, we kind of guess that probably they require exponential time, but we cannot prove that. And that's, so right now, so that would be ideal, ideal case. And in the future, somebody may prove that for many problems, the only way to solve them is to use exponential time. Right now, it's proven for very few problems and not for the many that we are really interested in. So therefore, this ideal case doesn't work. And we have to use something more complicated that requires several lectures and boring proofs in the theory of computation class, which is the notion of NP-hardness. And I'll try to give a kind of informal introduction to NP-hardness. And I'm gauging myself. This is very informal. I'm not writing a paper for communications of the ACM, so don't blame me. But I'm trying to avoid the oversimplification that NP means non-polynomial. OK. So what is NP-hardness? This notion was. So first of all, okay, so feasible and non-feasible. Feasible algorithm is something that can be done in polynomial time. So the running time on the algorithm on any input is bounded by some polynomial of the length of the set. n square, n cube, n to the power 4. And everybody understand this is not exactly a very perfect definition because you can have 10 to the power 40 times n, which is a real algorithm that has been proposed. Well, it's linear, but it's not exactly something you can implement on the real computer. On the other hand, you can have algorithms which require time like x of something 0, 0, 1 times n times something reasonable. And of course, it's exponential, but on all real type of data, it converges very well. So it's, it's the question of exercise. Actually, that's an interesting thing. Like I was working with engineers, they kind of I was shocked. They say, well, let's use some bounded function, like a logarithm. And I know, logarithms are bounded. <laughs> but for of course, when you have a scale from whatever it is, one millimeter to 10 kilometers, logarithm is bounded by a very small number. So from the point of practice, of course, it is bounded. So in this sense, of course, there is a difference. OK. So, uh, so feasible is this one, and then what we, how can we classify the problem? In order to classify the problem, we first need to describe what is a problem. And before we start going into the problems, I'll give you a very brief, informal introduction of what the problem is by listing problems from different disciplines. So what's a typical problem? What is a problem? And we will enumerate from the... Okay, in different disciplines. What's the problem in engineering? What do engineers do? And I would like students to give me answers. There are students here, right? There are no faculty, all faculty know that. <laughs> what do engineers do? I'm not talking professors of engineering, real engineers in the field. This isn't part of Right, like civil engineers, what do they do? Build, build. Build, build. Well, build the verb is build, they design them, right? I mean, they may also build, but. Okay, so what's. So the typical problem is this the input is specifications. It's actually called exactly the same way as in software engineering. And let me tell you the dirty secret. The word specifications was used by engineers way before software engineering. That's why it's called software engineering. It's borrowed from the engineering. So you want specifications. You want a bridge that will survive 20 trucks with like no, 100 tons each going at a speed of 60 miles per hour. Each of them like shaking in the rhythm of rock and roll, whatever it is, right? And the wind is blowing, and everybody's singing a happy song. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> so specifications. Now, now what we want, what we want, is the design. 
something that you see in the nice pictures. Like something like that, and there is a tower here, and there is something going up, and everybody is very happy. Now, once the design is there, in the past, of course, that was a complicated thing, but now there is software that enables you to check that given design satisfies the specifications. There may be some flaws and everything, but overall, checking is easy. So, once we have Y, we can efficiently check whether this design is, and again, specifications can be also on the cost, specification of the materials, specification can be on anything. Effectively check whether Y is a good specification. This satisfies the specification. Satisfies specification of X. Let's describe that C of X, Y is true. Okay? And of course the design cannot be too complicated because it needs to be doable. So the length of Y should be limited by some reasonable function of the length of X. And just like with here, we can assume that the length of Y should be limited by some polynomial of the length of X. Of course, if we have too many specifications, we want to make additional things and everything. Okay? So, bottom line, once we guess the answer, checking is easy. What is difficult is come up with that answer. Same thing like in astronomy. What do astronomers do sometimes? Not astronomers, people in celestial mechanics. They design trajectories that would require the least amount of fuel by using the gravity field of the planets to go from here to Jupiter. Once you have this trajectory, checking that it does its, that it's right, it's easy. But coming up with the trajectory is very complicated because it kind of requires a lot of parameters and it's very difficult to come up with. That's a typical engineering problem. Engineering. Okay. What do mathematicians do? Okay, torturing students with complicated formulas. But other than that. Anyway. Guys, you know what mathematicians do, right? Proof. Proof, okay, proofs. They're not computing anything, by the way. It's not what mathematicians do. We are computing. They may be designing algorithms sometimes, but they're not. They're proving. So what's the proof? What is given? Input given is a statement. A precise mathematical statement x. It could be some complicated formula in combinatorics, it could be some theorem about calculus, whatever it is. What are the desired outcome? What we want? What we want is a proof of either x or negation of x. So we want to either check, prove this hypothesis, or prove that this is wrong. Wait a second. Practically, my impression was that Mathematicians don't tend to prove on demand, but instead observe, realize that they can come up with a statement of something that's useful in general, and then which, which they can prove, and... Okay, so <laughs> engineers also sometimes don't do it on demand. But I'm just, I'm just describing the, formal, the formalized part of... What? I thought the fuzzy logic guys were doing that, and they wouldn't prove either x or not x. Yes, they are. Well, they also go and they prove degrees of no, 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 they prove the theorems, they prove the theorems. Fuzzy logic is not about proving something. Fuzzy logic is what is going on inside. You're confused about fuzzy logic. Yeah. So, when you prove a theorem, it's a theorem and theorem is true, or not. It can be a theorem about fuzzy logic, it can be a theorem about anything else. And actually, you could include in that models, right, analytical models. But you're not proving the model, but you, you know, you're best like, Basically validating rather than the model, in fact. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's but that's that's a little bit far away. Yeah, I'm model. just trying to okay. describe a, as a very very well, well formulated problem. Yes, sometimes people do creative things like engineers just design a bridge that is beautiful. That's impossible to formalize. I'm describing the formalization. This is a large part of mathematicians' activity. When you're a PhD student, your professor gives you a problem, or if it's a good professor, not one problem gives you several problems. That Hopefully you will solve one of them and you try to find the proof of one of them. If you are trying to be a field sprite winner, what you do is you find some famous problem and you try to solve it. Okay? Yes, you need to modify maybe, but that's kind of okay. So again, once the proof is there, how can you check? Well, if the proof is described in a way mathematicians normally describe, it's trivial, blah blah blah, it's very easy to prove, then it's difficult. But when it's described in all the boring details, Checking the proof is something that computers can do, actually, even already in the 60s. 
the early computers could check the proofs once they described in a lot of detail. So checking is easy. Once we have y, we can efficiently check. And again, what is needed, and this was a subject of controversy up to the famous computer user, computer based proof of the four color theory, where the computer produced a proof that at first nobody could check. So what we need to do is to make sure that this proof is not too late. It is bounded by some reasonable polynomial of the length of a state. Otherwise, you produce something, how do you know it's a proof? With four color problem, they simplified that because they came up with a proof which was much easier. Yes. Uh, I think I agree with uh, uh, Pat. Not ju just two suggestions here. I would say what we want is to prove x in light of theory t. And then you check what is checked. No, no, but I mean, depend, the word proof means proof in some theory, of course. How else can you prove? Well, but you can change the theory. That is your why. No, 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 no. If you change the theory, that's... Well, that, that's it. So you're proving x in light of this theory. In light of a given. Theory is given. If yeah. you can choose a theory, then it's not mathematics. It's something else. Well, you can, you can have some theories in mathematics. Well, but you, you can look. If you can always prove the theorem by making it an axiom, right? <laughs> that's, that's what happened. So what, what, what has happened with the fifth postulate? The computers could try to prove it that for every line outside the curve, every point, there's only one point. He couldn't prove it, so he made it an axiom. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't make it a You make an axiom, you have a new theorem. Well, but I mean, that's not a mathematical activity. Making it an axiom oh, yeah, yeah. is nice, but OK. So, but this, this is OK. I'm not saying this is all mathematicians do. They also go okay, to so bed, brush their teeth, and everything. But if, if you're saying, is this mathematics, this I is mathematics. I suggest that. So what do you mean by checker proof? Uh, 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 right? Sorry? What do you mean by checker proof? By what? Checking a proof. Yeah. Checking a proof. Yeah. You have a proof in a given theory, a formal proof, and you check it step by step. I what do you mean by that? Are the steps correct? How are the steps correct? Are they following the axioms? Like, you, you have a proof in propositional logic. You have like A implies B and you, and you have A and you conclude B and you check that this is indeed the use of more exponents. Or if you're using, you're substituting into some integral, some expression, and you're checking that this substitution was done right. Basically a rule-based theorem prover. Yeah. Yeah, but then what you're doing is just going towards the, the, the theory you have. But anyway, go ahead. Say again. <laughs> that depends on the theory. That of course have. it depends. The theory is given. Right. The theory is given. The, our objection is the following. To me, the proof means the theory is fixed. And you need to get a proof in this theory, yes. Usually, a theory is ZF, terminal of the set theory. Once you prove there, everything is OK. Sometimes, if you're not a mathematician, if you're a logician, then you want to make sure that this is proven not within the whole mathematics, but within a tiny thing, without right. using axiom of choice. That's a very specific, uh, specific and a small part of that, yes. If you, if you guys don't converge on this, would that prevent you from making the point you intended to no, make that's, that's next? That's what happened. Okay, because okay. the word check is kind of... Uh, uh, um, we bought the theory, at least for me, but go ahead. No, no, it's, it's a formal mathematics. Yeah. People have used this to prove there are theorem of uh, the <laughs> checkers. They exist. Yeah. yeah, work with them. What you do is to change one to another, to if the other, you don't want to trust more. No, 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 Trust is the wrong word here. Trust has nothing to do with math. We're talking about formal uh, checkers, not provers as proof. There are provers that prove. I'm talking about checking the proof. I know. I'm talking about Kessler, for instance, that is okay. a proof checker. Okay, so. Okay, so. Basically, you have to trust me and don't trust Paolo on that. <laughs> so, these are the two examples. That conversation is scheduled for after the colloquium today, actually. Sure, 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 sure. So, in these cases and in many other cases, you can have, you can add here physics. What do physicists do? There's no physicists here in the audience. So, what do you think the physicists do? What is the input? Input is the observed data in the world. Okay? Suppose we are. Talking about something, okay, what do what, what the physicists do? Okay, I'm giving you a hint. So there is Ohm, right? You know Ohm. You know Ohm could be what? But there was a guy, right? Ohm. What he did is he measured. This is current, this is voltage. And he got some points. So I think they crossed to zero. That's right. 
Start following something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Explains all the data. So we want is find a theory, find a formula y that explains all the data. That's actually what Newton did. Newton had in his position all this observable data about the planets and everything, and you can follow them and even predict the eclipses and everything, but he found a simple formula that enables you to generate all this data and explain all this. So, again, once the formula with the noise, with the noise it will fit well. Okay? <laughs> That's actually what all there is. There's a whole literature about how good it is that these guys had very inaccurate measurements. Because that way they thought it's linear, they thought it's quadratic like Galileo and everything, and only until Gauss started getting measurements which you know what Gauss, right? He was checking the fifth postulate. He was trying to find out whether the sum of the three angles of the triangle is indeed 180 degrees. And what he did without telling anybody, he went to the three mountains in the Alps and measured very accurately the three angles and he added them up and he didn't get 180 degrees. But he was smart enough, instead of publishing a paper, he started thinking about analyzing, redoing measurements and he came up with Gaussian distribution, probability notions, and so on, but that would kind of help after that. Okay, so if once you have the data, checking that the data fits the formula is easy. If the formula is given. Of course, if the formula is given as a partial differential equation, and then you still need to find out how to match that, that's complicated. Like in current string theory, there are formulas, and nobody knows how to match them with anything observable at all. So that's not good yet. But once the, the theory comes to the level of actual prediction, all you have to do is to match and to see if it fits. Now again, we need to make sure that length of y is actually smaller than the length of x. Otherwise, we can use the following formula. If, like, look up table. If the current is 1 ampere, then use 2 volts. If 2 ampere, use 4 volts, and so on. This will fit all the data, but it will be a very lousy formula, because we really need to compress the information. So in all these cases, what we have is what we have is the following structure. And again, since we're talking about something that can be implemented formally in the computer, everything is translated into zeros and ones. We can as well talk about binary sequences implementing all that stuff. So the general description is the following. We are given a binary sequence x. There is also a predicate which can be computed in polynomial and feasible time. And there is also a polynomial, P sub L, polynomial. And we need to find y such that c of x, y is true, and the length of y is bounded by the length, the polynomial of the length of x. This is a very general description describing everything that we have. Now, in, there have been a lot of, this formula was, this idea was presented in late 60s, early, nine, uh, early 70s, and there was a competition of what's the best name for it. And they came up with the name that is a little bit weird, but it comes from the following. I, probably most people heard about non-deterministic automata, non-deterministic this non-deterministic, that non-deterministic basically means we don't know how it does, but if if we know the past, then it's like an automata. And non-deterministic automata is something real. This is something that is used in compiling and everything, and it's translated in the real automata. But here we're talking about non-deterministic Turing machine. A Turing machine is a general device to do computations. What does it mean, non-deterministic Turing machine? It's a Turing machine which allows, as an additional step, a guess. And so MP is the natural, is the general name of the class, which means non-deterministic polynomial. What does it mean, non-deterministic polynomial? It means once you made a guess, you can check that the guess is correct in polynomial time. So that's kind of the general definition of the class MP. So you have the class of problems MP. Within that class, you have a subclass of all the problems which can be solved in polynomial time. 
And as I mentioned earlier, whether p is equal to np, whether all problems from the class np can be solved in polynomial time, nobody knows. This is a million dollar question. I mean, real million dollar. If you solve it, you get a million dollar for sure in addition to world fame and everything. <laughs> one of the famous problems for which there is actually one million dollar allocated somewhere. I hope it is in dollars. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, euros or dollars, it's, it's a big sum of money. Okay. So, but, so we don't know about any of the problems from the class NP. Maybe they can be all solved in polynomial time, although most computer scientists believe they cannot be. But what we do know is there are some problems which are more difficult than others. More difficult in the following sense that we can reduce other problems to these ones. So, what does it mean reduce? So, first of all, the notion of reduction. And it's difficult to find a good reduction, so I'll, I'll try. I was just teaching exactly this material now in the theory of combination class. And it's kind of the only the, the good reduction that at least some people may relate to is uh, with the logarithms. Uh, mathematicians know that, some computer scientists know that, but logarithm, which is now viewed as <coughs> a mathematical function, which has nothing to do with at least by CS1 students, which has nothing to do with computing. It's just we are forced to learn it for no reason at all. <laughs> it actually was invented not as a mathematical function. It was invented as a way to simplify computations. Because in the old days, when there were no computers and no calculators, what did people do? They had to calculate by hand. And addition is easy. Multiplication is more difficult, right? Because what's multiplication? You have to have two numbers and then write this, 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 and then add. So it's a lot of multiplication. So, what Navier came up with the following trick. He invented this function logarithm, which is basically which is like the power to which you need raised the base to get the number. And the idea was the property of this function is that the logarithm of the product is equal to the sum of the logarithms. And so what do you need to do if you need to multiply the two numbers? Well, you find the logarithms, you add them, once you get them, what do you get? The logarithm of the product. And then you find the number whose logarithm is this one, and this is a times b. This is something that was implemented in the so tempting called slide rule. The slide rule you may still see, bless you, in the engineering building. Uh, on the second floor, there is a very big slide rule. In the old days, how can you tell at least a new young engineer? He goes proudly wears the slide rule in his pocket. And I, I should say that when my dad worked at Los Alamos during the war at, and, at, in Chicago, they, they needed big, fast calculations and they had a room, I guess that either the size of this room, a very large slide rule run by two grad students. Okay. You know, and they'd call <laughs> up and you know, give them the numbers and they would, they would tell you what the results were. Right. <laughs> so basically what logarithm and the slide rule works on very briefly give you the idea. So it has two things. In one of them, in each of them you have the logarithms here and the actual original numbers here. So you get the number, you take the visor and you set up against this number, you get the logarithm. Mm -hmm. Then you set another thing here. It also has the same thing here, a logarithm, here are numbers. You set the number, you get the logarithm, you add the logarithms by moving them. And then you look up the visor and you see what the number is that is the product. So it's kind of a reasonably simple device, but it's a little bit complicated. Okay. So anyway, what does reduction mean? So we take two numbers, we have the problem. We have A and B, and we want to compute the product. How do we do that? Well, we first reduce it. We compute logarithms. Then we solve another problem, the problem of computing the sum. And based on that problem, we go back and we compute this is a, what is normally called reduction. So the general idea of reduction is the following. You have a problem. You have x, you need to find y. What does that mean to reduce to another problem? You have one efficient algorithm, feasible time algorithms, that reduces here. And then, once you solve that problem, there is another algorithm that goes back and finds the solution to the original problem. And of course, you need to make sure that no solutions are lost in this process, because if this, so there is something else, but I'll skip for that. So this is kind of a general idea of reduction. And so we say that a problem is NP complete if any problem from the class NP can be reduced to this problem. So far, so good. This is 
The most well-known problem, which is NP-complete, is the so-called, so I'll just write here, definition, reduced in the normal way. So if we can solve satisfiability fast, then correspondingly we can use that algorithm to solve all the other problems fast as well. So NP-complete, a problem, is NP-complete if we can reduce every problem from the class NP, problem P0, from the class NP to this problem. And this is actually a general definition. It doesn't have to be NP-complete. You can have other classes. And in those classes, we have also complete problems in the sense that they are the toughest. So if we want to prove that some problem is difficult, you don't need to compare it with the others. All you need to do is to prove that this is NP-complete. That means it's tough. It's like you come to the new, you move, like suppose you're in high school. You move to the new school, right? How do you prove that you are the strongest guy in the class? You don't need to beat up everybody. All you need to do is to beat up the strongest bully in the class. <laughs> After that, everybody knows that you are the strongest. That's actually the way to prove any class. Don't prove that everything else is reduced. You prove that this problem, which is known to be, is reduced to this one. And then automatically, everybody reduced to it. The most well-known problem is propositional satisfiability, which basically is the following. You are given a propositional formula. What's a propositional formula? It's kind of something like you have some variables and you use and and or x1 or not x2 or x3 and not x1 or x2 and some etc okay and you need to find the values of the variables to make it true this formula has many origin in computer science the main origin of this problem is testing because when you test how do you test a program which has if statements well, you need to test all the branches. So for that, you need to find out the combination of the variables that makes you go into that branch. And sometimes, actually, it's an interesting thing, because sometimes the branch is added just for security. And in reality, there is no way that you can get it to that branch. There's, but that's, it turns out this is a difficult problem. This is an empty, complete problem. It's well known, it's well understood how to solve it if you have n variables in exponential time. All you need to do is to check all possible combinations of x1 true and false, x2 true and false, and so on. If you have x1 true and false, true and false, that's two combinations. Then for each of them you have the second one, so you have, you multiply by 2, you get 2 to the power 2 combinations of two variables, you get 2 to the power n combination of n variables, that's exactly the exponential time algorithm. Now, this is something that people know, this is something that all our uh, graduate students are supposed to know after the theory of computation class. Uh, and this is how it was before this Papadimitrius work. And before we go but, further... But, it, but the idea is that if, if, if you propose a solution, you can check in linear time whether or not that solution... In feasible time, not linear, feasible. Not in all time. Right. Maybe this yeah. one, anyway, this particular one. I mean, in this particular case, it's even linear time. Yes. Yeah. Once you get a solution, yes, you can check. Easily, you can just run it through in this explicit expression and compute easily yes what can be reduced. In this case, it's linear. So there are two different notions of NP hardness, which are kind of almost equivalent. Two notions. The one that I like personally because it was invented by Levin, who was originally in Russia, the student of Kolmogorov, who is now in Boston University, is exactly like this: given x, find y. And there is another version which was invented by the two other co-inventors. This thing was invented simultaneously by three different people. And they had the following problem. Instead of given x, find y, check whether there exists a y. It's called decidability. Okay. So they, they didn't consider the actual problem of finding it. They only considered the problem of checking if solution exists. Why this is in sufficient, kind of, in this, in this case, because suppose you have this problem, right? Suppose you only are able to check whether the solution exists, but you don't know what the solution is. How will you find the solution? Well, that's easy. You take x1, you plug in here x1 equal to true, x1 equal to false. If, and you check if their solution exists where x1 is true. If x1 is true, the solution exists, you keep x1 true. If not exists, you start, you put x1 equal to false. And that way, easily you can find that solution. 
But in some problems, this don't work, and this is the problem that we will be dealing with now. So the first problem that uh, come with is the so-called problem of Nash equilibrium. What is Nash equilibrium? Well, you all know who Nash was, right? There was a movie, The Beautiful Mind. There was a guy who later became crazy and then became less crazy, but he was one of the founders and the Nobel Prize winner of game theory, and he came up with this idea of solution. What does it mean, Nash equilibrium? Nash equilibrium means the following, that you have several people who are doing different things and they have different uh, preferences, they have different interests. How do you kind of reconcile them? Well, one idea is the following, that if everybody else is doing exactly the same thing as before, then you should not benefit from changing your mind. So everybody is doing the best they can do under the condition that everybody, uh, everybody else is doing that. I'm kind of formulating it in a better way, but I'll give you two examples, you understand what I'm talking about. First example is the famous example of prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma can be formulated in this way. I'll start it. Like in some states, you cannot even take guns with you legally, okay? There was a story recently on the TV. I don't know, Olga watched it. Like in New Mexico, some guy took a gun out and pointed to the policeman or something. And it turns out he didn't do anything illegal. It's legal in the state of New Mexico to carry a gun. It's legal to point it at somebody as long as you don't shoot. <laughs> do you have to have any reason to point it at somebody? He said he was joking or something. <laughs> no, no, it was not threatening or anything, just out of the blue. And then they didn't shoot you. They didn't even know, but there is a law, it turns out, in the state of it. So, in some states, this is not a law, okay? It's like when, when we have people that coming here for a conference, like in New York City. Yeah. Come, people coming here for a conference, I thought, okay, so they take photos of Mexico, they take photos of our campus, and then when the bus comes, they all take photos. Why? Because on every bus in El Paso, there is a sign, weapons not allowed inside, right? <laughs> this is not something you see in New York City, okay? <laughs> so basically, suppose the two criminals are caught red-handed in New York City. Not completely red-handed. There is a lot of suspicion, a lot of uh, incomplete evidence, but they all have their guns with them, which immediately, according to the laws of New York City and New York State, makes them eligible for the prison jail term. Supposedly for one year, okay? So, and the question is, each of them has the possibility of either confess or not confess. And they were planning like bank robbery or whatever it is, okay? If nobody confesses, then they go to jail for carrying guns. So the first gets one year in jail, the second gets one year in jail. If both confesses, to the planning of bank robbery, then because they confessed, it's smaller than the usual big term, so suppose it's five. Okay? If one of them confesses, another doesn't, then the guy who confesses, his lawyer negotiates an agreement that he will be given only a conditional statement, blah, 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 and so he gets maybe zero, and the other guy, so with the first guy confess, not, does not confess, this is the second guy, the first guy confesses, the second does not. So the, the first guy who does not confess, uh, the second guy who confessed, he gets zero. The first guy gets the maximum. The case goes to the jury and they say, well, yes, there were two people trying to rob the bank, but the second confessed because his conscience praised him, and this guy is a hardened criminal. He should go to Sing Sing. They still have Sing Sing for 10 years. Same thing here. So the question is, what is the equilibrium? So it turns out that the best equilibrium here, so you would think that this is the best arrangement for both of them, but in reality the Nash equilibrium is this one. Why? Because this situation is unstable. Under this condition, if nobody confesses, right, if, if the first guy does not confess, I'm the second guy, if I confess, I get my jail term decreased from one to zero, which is the best for me. So the only stable equilibrium here is this one, five and nine. So, another case which people in this room will understand, I hope so, is the penalty kick in what Americans call soccer. You know the idea, right? So there is a, the big gate and there is a poor goalkeeper and if he stays in the middle, then 
he has very little chances of catching the ball. So what normally he's doing, and that's there's a usually like what is boring to a, you know, Americans to watch, but what is very exciting to everybody who is a soccer fan is that to see how they just trying to cheat each other. And so the idea is if the guy who is sending the kick kicks here and this guy jumps here, there's no chance. So you can kick to the left, kick to the right, uh, jump, dive to the left, dive to the right, and if you kick in the right place, then this team, uh, which has the goalkeeper, this team wins, the other team loses. In this case, the same. In this case, the other way around. So in this case, there is a Nash equilibrium in so-called uh, mixed strategy. What's a mixed strategy? Instead of going in one direction, it's the same thing as suppose somebody says, let's play the game. You think of plus and minus, I will try to guess. What's the best strategy? It's not to select plus or minus, it's to select something at random. That way the other guy cannot select. So the same thing here. You should flip a coin and either dive to the left or dive to the right. Then the probability is one half, and this turned out to be and same thing for the goalkeeper and same thing for the attacker. <coughs> so this is Nash equilibrium. Now, it turns out that uh, Nash proved a theorem that according to some reasonable conditions, if you have finite number of players, finite number of strategies, blah, 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 and there's a difference between practical and mathematical mentality. I sent the first version of the abstract, and Francois immediately pointed out that if you have infinite number of strategies, then Nash's theorem is not always true, which is correct. But for the practical purpose, if you have finite number of strategies, finite number of players, everything is good, then there is always an equilibrium. The question is how to compute it. And it was known for a long time that computing is difficult. It's an empirical fact. Theory by Nash. Nash equilibrium always exists. There is an empirical fact that Nash equilibrium is difficult to compute. So people try to think that maybe it is empty hard in some reasonable sense. But if you have this definition, all we're checking is whether there exists a solution. In this case, solution always exists. So it doesn't fall into the standard notions of empty hardness. And it's a little bit trickier, but this doesn't help either because, for example, satisfiability for non they are. So we need a new notion of complexity. And this notion was invented by Pogodimitro and others in several of their papers. And I'll just use the cheat sheet because this is not something I remember by heart as opposed to the previous thing. It's called P P A D. So polynomial parity argument or directed graphs. Okay. So, what does it mean polynomial parity argument for directed graphs? It means a very simple thing. That if you have a directed graph and you have a node in which the number of uh, inputs is different from the number of outputs, then there should be at least one other such node. Why? Because every arrow has an input and an output. So the total number of inputs should be equal to the total number of outputs. So if it's some node is unbalanced, there should be another unbalanced node. That's a very easy argument, right? That's kind of similar to what is called Dirichlet principle. If you have n boxes and total of at least n plus one. If it's some other mapping, there's always a map. So every mapping of a disk into itself has a fixed point. Continuous. Continuous, yes. 
Otherwise, you can easily swap two coins and get a misconstruction. Yes. So, this theory was not easy to prove. And 